Hello and good evening, everyone. I'm Afifa Nusrat, and I welcome you all to the sixth Avni annual lecture, which is being conducted as part of Disha 20, the orientation program, and the Avni lecture and workshop series entitled Building Voices, Building Alliances. Just to give a brief about the orientation program, Disha is the Avni orientation program for the first year students. The program includes lectures, workshops, studio exercises conducted both by the Avni team and invited guests. The word Disha comes from a Sanskrit term meaning direction. This is also a platform where master practitioners from various fields engage with our students in a collaborative environment, exploring and expanding Avni's design approach to design education. This intensive week of orientation began with the inaugural session on 30th November, and today we'll be concluding this week with the Avni annual lecture being delivered by Dr. Anup Makundu. I would also request you all to please keep your mics on mute uh, during the length of the talk. Uh, and now I'll hand it over to Dr. Kush Patel. Kush. Thank you. Thank you, Afifa. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Kush Patel, um, Associate Professor of Architecture and Humanities at Avani Institute of Design. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Anupama Kundu, who's joining us uh, this afternoon from Berlin to talk about uh, their contributions to the field and practice of architecture would take me longer than my allotted minutes, but I'll try. Dr. Anupama Kundu's internationally recognized and award-winning architecture practice started in 1990, 30 years ago, demonstrating a strong focus on material research and experimentation towards an architecture that has low environmental impact and is appropriate to the socioeconomic context. She has built extensively in India and has had the experience of working, researching, and teaching in a variety of educational contexts around the world, from TU Berlin, the AA School of Architecture London, Parsons New School of Design New York, the University of Queensland Brisbane, to IUAV in Venice and ETSAB Barcelona. In 2014, she was the Strouch Visiting Critic at Cornell University and is currently a professor at UCJC in Madrid, where she's also the chair of Affordable Habitat. Dr. Kundu was born in Pune. She graduated from Sir J.J. College of Architecture, University of Mumbai in 1989 and received her PhD degree from TU Berlin in 2008. Her projects and writings have been featured in a range of books, journals, and newspapers, including Fiden World Atlas of Contemporary Architecture, AD Architectural Design London, Architecture Australia, Architectural Review Australia, India Today, Bauchwelt, and Dudzam Bauen. As sustainability consultant to ICAEN for an Asia Herbs Partnership Project of the European Commission from 2012 to 2014, she co-edited the Sustainable Building Design Manual Volumes 1 and 2, which reflect a partnership between municipalities of London, Barcelona, and Gurgaon in India. In 2009, she authored a book entitled Roger Angers, Research on Beauty about the life and work of a prominent Parisian architect of the 50s and 60s, who was appointed the chief architect of Auroville, an idealistic city project located in Tamil Nadu. Further, the jury of the 2013 Arc Vision International Prize for Women and Architecture awarded her an honorable mention for her dedication when approaching the problem of affordability of construction and sustainability in all aspects of the built environment. One of Dr. Kundu's latest publication is a chapter which I have enjoyed reading very much entitled Rethinking Affordability in Economic and Environmental Terms uh, in the 2015 Routledge book on inclusive urbanization, rethinking policy, practice, and research in the age of climate change. Three decades of her work are currently on exhibit at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art in Denmark. Today's talk is not just connected to this exhibit and its theme of time as a resource for architecture, but also in very many ways, deeply aligned with the curatorial focus of Building Voices, Building Alliances speaker series at Avani Institute of Design. 
Understandably then, my conversations with Anupama prior to her confirmation were also around two titles that she had suggested for this talk. The first one being building knowledge, and the second one, which we decided to go ahead with, being slow architecture. Either of these titles resonate deeply with not just the use of building in our speaker series title as both a noun and verb, but also the deliberate orientation of the series towards thinking with individuals and groups, both in and connected to architecture, to foreground the practice of knowledge and meaning making through space and architecture, and to take it as its point of departure the importance of architecture's embeddedness within wider spatial politics and its participation in the discourse on social and environmental responsibility. Lastly, and before I invite Anupama to give the orientation keynote this afternoon, I want to acknowledge the presence of students and academic colleagues joining us from various parts of Kerala, the country, and even internationally in this pandemic. And a relief to know that the Met Department has just withdrawn the red alert issued for Cyclone Burevi and rains in the seven southernmost districts of the state. On that uneventful note, welcome Anupama. Well, thank you so much, Afifa and Kush, for having me here. Um, and also thank, uh, thank all of you for attending. I'm really looking forward to the interaction later. I had asked Kush, actually, can he not just show an online lecture and use all the time to, to interact? Because I already know my work, so I usually feel much more interested in the encounter and sometimes in... Uh, um, times like post COVID where we people miss interaction. I think it's nice to do more of that because when you're not in the room with the people and you're just doing a monologue, it's kind of even less interesting for me. So, but anyway, we've come out with a half and half approach. So I'm going to, uh, lead you through some of the, um, for, of some of the process of, uh, um, my work more than the products, but I want to also explain um, my personal journey in this profession and how, despite what one achieves, um, actually with the through the architecture, I want to share how rewarding it can be personally. Because you know, after all, we pers we ourselves are our own main project. You know, what are we doing, and what will we become as a result of that? What we did or what we think, how is it going to shape who we are? And I think I approached, uh, I found architecture as a very holistic kind of education. Um, it, it brought, helps us to integrate all kinds of subjects. And it, it helps us to actually also, if we want to use all that knowledge, also for ourselves to advance as, as uh, homo sapiens, uh, collectively and also individually. So I hope, uh, um, that I can, um, I just want to make a summary of the title, Slow Architecture, not because I believe in delaying or not because I'm glorifying slowness that we sometimes have uh, because of procrastination, not at all. I'm trying to say that if we are rushing about, like in the story of the hare and the tortoise, um, you know, if we don't have a focus and you're in such a big hurry, we may, we are not present sometimes in our own lives and we are producing things that maybe we really need to think about why we are doing what we do at all. Uh, and sometimes when you run about like that, you don't think. And I think I just wanted to sort of bring that mood in to all the rapid urbanization that's happening in India and my chosen response to that. I'm going to now hope to smoothly project my screen. Uh, now, let me see where that is. Now, well, okay. Um, I would like to start um, by, first of all, reminding us, if you look from far, if you zoom out a little bit and look at, um, not only to zoom out in, in, in the space and look at the big picture, but also zoom out in terms of time and look at the past as before we project the future, you can see that good architecture in, in our heritage has always been about, about architecture being rooted in a specific place. 
So what does it mean to be rooted in a place? Um, you know, local materials were, we, we, we have built very uh, outstanding architecture with whatever was around us, you know, and you can see in this image um, that, you know, that how architecture is just a refined labor and crafting um, of, of the human hand that has been able to take whatever is around it and not only solve shelter issues, but with the refinement, you know, that, um, that it, the making of architecture resulted in the making of the human capacity even. The, the, the finesse has uh, exhibited itself in uh, iconic architecture. So the local skill and the local material goes hand in hand and that's how we can measure we can we it, it records um the evolution of humans as a society as well so in the past we have see we have taken generations sometimes to complete a project and cities take lifetimes to create also but right now in the name of rapid urbanization we have been um thinking that we have to speed up so much in what we produce. We think that as if this urbanization that is uh, unstoppable is, is such a quick and fast thing, we, uh, we assume that we can um, cut back on the time required to think before we act. And we want to start with ourselves as if the project begins with ourselves. We don't want to work on visions of our ancestors or, you know, uh, and, and we just, every generation starts, by the time they are old, they have come to some level of maturity and knowledge, and then the, then they, they, they pass on, and we start again, and we are creating a very, very disruptive uh, way of building for the future. I think in the, you know, whenever humans have passed away, everything they made, whether it is expensively crafted saris or jewelry, or uh, houses or cities, people have moved on. All that was left for the future generation to use. Now, if we are producing things which are very uh, inappropriate for if, if they are not standing the test of time, then they stand as a burden on all of us. So I prefer that we don't cut back on the time taken to think because if or to make things, keeping this larger view in mind, especially because India, in the Indian context, we are still primarily an agri agricultural society uh, and we are rapidly transforming and flocking to the cities and we are, um, which, you know, this is a picture of Bombay where I grew up taking all these crowded trains. On one hand, it's not bad because India has a huge population, but, you know, we are one sixth of the planet inhabiting only 2.4% of the Earth's land. So we have very different, um, we have to divide our resources in a very different way because we have more mouths to feed. And not every formula you see working in another European city can be easily applied here. And so we need to look at what are the consequences, not only environmental consequences, but social and economic consequences of creating this kind of high standard habitat uh, or 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 and not taking the whole society um, forward. But, you know, like, for instance, you see this is an image in Gurgaon. This is a typical image from uh, Indian cities where in the peripheries you have this, you see there are three skylines in the city. There's this middle city line where haphazardly growing peripheral, you know, um, developments where there's not yet clear bylaws perhaps alongside highways, etc. You see that kind of, skyline and then there are all these public private uh, or whatever developer driven uh, you know say glitzy buildings and in order to build those people will migrate from various places and they create the four line of uh, the the skyline which is in the foreground and this that that the creation of informal settlements is is quite problematic because we are in fact creating an urban form where social segregation is sanctioned and it's the it's the nature of our cities and the, the two um, sectors as it were 
they are so interdependent that uh, they uh, they need each other indispensably to exist but they are live in a embedded inequality and i think this again this image from bombay does not it's even more complex than that because it's not as if all these are slums as they are called a lot of of these were kind of village settlements where an older lifestyle service uh, services have been developed etc but the kind of ap apartments projected are out of their reach this so there is this divide that is being continuously crystallized and there is also this other phenomenon that in um, see when i talked about kerala immediately you spoke about the local food in uh, you know what you would have offered me had i come uh, to meet you there personally so you know we have uh, in india not only so many languages we have so many building um technologies according to the materials and local culture in every space but everything has been uniformly replaced by reinforced concrete structures and uh, bricks which are not even allowed to carry load but just used as infill so we are uh, using we've created created a new vernacular uh, which is uh, actually standardized and it's alienated from all our knowledge and skills so the way to build in these you know industrialization mainstream industrialization happened in some parts of the world and they started building in standardized ways uh with high uh, embodied energy but in india we have we are trying to do that without having got industrialized mainstream in the first place and that also is problematic and it comes with a huge uh a negative impact so i used to think when i graduated on this kind of uh, thoughts you know that there is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all this is a, a quote i found from peter drucker many years later but it, this resonated with my own thoughts i used to wonder when i look at that zoom out view of what we are building i feel when you say rapid urbanization we are building very ugly things in high speed and i think half of those are not really necessary because you pay exorbitant amounts for apartments which you don't even like so um so this was the main problematic so when 30 years ago when i uh, i'm going to try to keep my own talk short so i'm just going to show you some of the images and we can discuss these later when we speak uh, through your questions but i left bombay uh on a kind of quest and a search and i wanted to understand the country and during my travels i landed in oroville and uh that was in 1990 it was very simple still and i made this house for myself um as you can see with round wood uh, these are made with casuarina uh, poles that were um used actually as scaffolding and you know i i had also um uh, like fry auto also advocated that instead of using timber if you use the whole round section you get a younger tree to be able to give you the same cross section and so i was i was thinking and appreciating uh, not only the simple way in which the bulk of india lives but of course i used design to make you know to make all conscious kind of construction around what i found around me as materials and way of living and i because as a young as idealistic architect i also wanted to uh, be free and not just take up any jobs just to occupy my time i wanted to in fact do the opposite i wanted to liberate my time i wanted my life to not cost so much that i have to give all my time away to be just able to pay a rent somewhere or to not you know i just was ready to reduce uh and yeah i had that feeling that all i want is less so it went with my lifestyle i had a bicycle i uh, all of this is tied with coconut rope granite pillars there's no cement even in the foundation of the you know uh, essential structure then later i had a motorbike i started um you know i lived very simply i had built this house thinking it would last for a year or so and being young i thought there was a lot of time to uh, win for myself to do take some time to think what to do with the rest of my life um because i didn't i i didn't know what i really wanted but i knew that i didn't want to be part of 
an industry that is churning out things which I wasn't liking. So I just um, started traveling actually to think about all that. And then this was my space. And, you know, I landed up living here for 10 years. The first 10 years, this was my house before I built the ball house, which I'll also show you. It was very empty. There was really such kind of homes. I wanted to question what is permanence, what is temporary. And I wanted to also just uh, have the time and the nothingness. I needed the time to do nothing. So I can listen to my own voice. I can uh, understand uh, and face all the contradictions and, you know, come to some sense of inner clarity. And I, I would say that all the success I had later had to do with that, I think, when I now look back. And it took me 30 long years to be where I am, still pursuing the same thing. But I had all that life experience, you know, where and I had liberated a lot of time. Um, so I... I was able to look what was going on around me. At that time, Aur Auroville was very barren and I, it looked like there's nothing. What do you build a city with? There's nothing around you. But when I, because I took the time to venture out with a bicycle and look around me, I noticed that all these things look like nothing happens because when you see the landscape, you know, and I, I realized that, you know, I, I never was uh, obsessed with the material aspect of architecture. I was rather interested in the spatial qualities and the negative spaces that make the feelings that are required, you know, for the human to feel well. But uh, I realized that in our age, the materiality of our architecture is problematic and in terms of current trends. And I started observing that how people, like if you see this man ex extracting by hand a slab of granite and be behind in this right corner, you see his village. And all of them are working with granite. And the sound of this chipping is very pleasant as well because it's all at the human scale. The extraction of material and the production of architecture is, is very different when you have an industrialized quarry and those machine sounds of cutting those slabs where people in India, uh, now these some of these villages have got those machines and the people are going deaf because it became the industrialization is not unproblematic and it totally takes things out of the human scale. So in my first few projects, I so this is what I mean by slow architecture is if you think that it makes sense to take local materials and the opportunity of projects to develop, to build knowledge, to build community, to help the resources reach everybody, the artisans and everyone, and you can still create contemporary architecture. These are self-supporting slabs that are uh, placed in dry um, chips of stone. Uh, so it's it's a quite a nice engineering detail and uh, showcasing. This was for a made in India uh, kind of design store thing. Every every object was made in handmade. So I wanted the architecture to be also handmade. So it's very contemporary, but the back end was that those people were getting a further livelihood through their craft rather than dying out. And um, so, you know, I started doing a lot of other projects with materials from the pot. And uh, sometimes it is told that it will be too expensive to make, uh, you know, stone, random stone, cut everything. It's something we always did. And the know-how is also vanishing but and therefore people don't want to do it but uh, if you do it uh, I think it is very rewarding and you leave when you finish a project you leave a lot of people empowered with more knowledge and skills including ourselves and that helps us to do the next project and also for the craftsmen so rather than uh, looking for a vernacular architecture I was trying to avoid some of the contemporary problems of a negative impact around architecture um, and so similarly, I started exploring and understanding, you know, and also very influenced by Laurie Baker, whom I had met personally, um, and Ray Meeker and other people also of development or alternatives. And there were in, in the time I graduated, it was already known, these environmental problems, etc. But 30 years later, we have hardly made a big impact, although we knew what the problem is. And that's what happens when you're rushing. You don't take the time because you think I have to deliver, I have to deliver. And then collectively, 
we have got an even bigger problem 30 years later of the same thing which we knew because we didn't do anything towards it. So I noticed as I used to roam around that uh, actually through Laurie Baker, I, I started, he opened my awareness, I would say, to realize that the local brick, which is inferior in quality, is, is a better brick than the industrial one because of the way it is fired in the same way that Mohenjo-daro Harappa bricks were fired where the kiln is part of the brick making and when it's finished the landscape becomes empty again and the people who so when I was in Auroville I used to go and take time and observe these people and notice how the making of materials are so embedded in the territory the same people who are doing rice farming in other seasons when they can't do that or they don't need to do that they are taking the silt that collected, making bricks out of it, making casuarina plantations to supply um, their own reforested material for scaffolding. By the way, that is the scaffolding material with which I made my hut also. But the thinnings get harvested and used as fuel. So there is a kind of interdependent thing happening in territories. And you take one of these elements out, everything can collapse. So I realized why um, local lime making, um, brick making, etc., should be supported, even if it's weaker. I realized, you know, I prefer to take something from my area, and then if I need thicker walls because the brick is weaker, uh, I can, I should find a way to use it. So in my early times, I used to notice some potters who were also losing their livelihood, and I used to, you know, as I spent time to observe my immediate, to be present in my immediacies, I started realizing what kind of wealth of knowledge and uh, invisible communities actually coexist there. And I started trying to produce roofing systems out of, see, I, I didn't, I don't, I wasn't nostalgic about the potter and keeping their pot alive. You know, I felt like the skill is what I would like to keep alive and build upon. I didn't mind. I'm not a nostalgic person. I don't mind if those pots are not used anymore for cooking rice. You know, I was more interested in the potter's community being also able to evolve. And for us in architecture, finding products um, where we could find a higher insulated product, you can see how, unlike in a factory, among this rice fields and banana plantations, these people are actually producing with coconut shells, a very high quality product. And this is the negotiation of high tech with low tech where through engineering knowledge, instead of like the Kerala tiles, where you use huge amounts of wood to be able to support those roofs, I was trying to uh, resort to um, catenary curves to eliminate all the substructure. This was also influenced by Rajendra and Rupal Desai's work uh, in in uh, Baroda. Uh, in in actually, uh, I forgot uh, Valod. It's a small village where they were working, and uh, so yeah, I I sort of together with masons and potters and also some experts like Remika. Um, the Californian ceramist who started Golden Bridge Pottery, through community uh, and, and linking with people, I started coming up with roofing systems. Like you see here, is the, the, then after 10 years later, I got the idea. I was always feeling like taking the Laurie Baker filler slab and increasing the slab depth to make even less steel than, to save even more steel than he did. Um, and uh, so I was trying to make loss shattering slabs with with so little steel, you know. And so some I, I did a lot of that kind of experimentation. And because in the main roof I showed you um, vault where you don't need any steel, you can't use the terrace because the form gives strength. You need it to be a, a vault. So I started using jack arches which were insulated and I kept on experimenting with various materials in my early part. So here you see one of the more known houses of mine, my own house where I moved um, when I uh, began, you know, uh, to get out of the hut, you know, and I had already built for various people. So in 2000, I actually moved into this house and these bricks are also very thin bricks. They are only two and a half centimeters 
high. They, they are the they were the ancient bricks that were being made and are still being made. There are many sizes that are made in in India actually of bricks, the handmade bricks uh, that are not influenced by the Mackay and the British metric standards, and they are still available. So I took that with lime mortar and I produced a house like that for myself to test various roofing systems. And actually these tests were made. You'll see there is steel and concrete and all materials here because I was testing all kinds of things on my own house, uh, which were actually needed in other jobs. Like uh, I had a I had a multi-purpose hall of 13 meter span for which I wanted this coffered ceiling. And so I tested it on my house. So, um, you know, then there are ferro cement screens and things like that. But the house itself is very much like the hut, very empty double height volume for the social spaces very low spaces for it's all empty I, I learned how to live with very little because i realized that i like i enjoy you know when they say that um, the optimist and the pessimist you know if you see the glass half full or half empty i actually like empty because i find empty is great because if it's empty you can fill every day what you want you don't carry the baggage of the past into the future so my home it's just a lot of spaces, um, you know, but um, yeah, but but mostly was very much about experimenting with building technologies that because as, as I told you, space, the negative space is the most important thing for me, the quality of the space that I designed, but I want it to be held and defined by materials that are also benign and they help anchor the contemporary architecture to the spot and through the people and through the making. So some of those things, I'm just going to show you now a couple of projects in other cities. This is in Pune. This one is a daycare center. We just opened last year in Pondicherry. And this is a very radical experimentation where we build mud houses and bake them in situ, inspired by Raymaker's um, fired houses and including him uh, guiding this process so you know a mud house is built and uh, like the house is entirely even roofs and everything is made with mud and mud mortar and it's it's used as an oven because you know if you build in the typical ovens about 40 percent of the heat is absorbed by the walls so we wanted the house to be an oven to fire other products and the house gets cooked as a consequence of the heat that is generated in order to cook the product. So a mud house cooked for three or four days along with its products inside helps us to achieve a brick a waterproofness, a water resistance of, you know, in our monsoon. And this is an experimental project uh, it's in voluntariat for homes for homeless children. And alongside you have also produced a lot of uh, you know building materials rather than being a consumer we are we, we are a local producer of healthy material with which you can finish the rest of the house or sell and recover the firing costs so so i, I did i did a lot of experimental projects uh, this is a school for uh, no, sorry, this is a library which includes Braille books. This is also in Pondicherry. Most of these architectures were made with very humble means, but I also did a lot of experimentation in other materials, like in even with reinforced cement concrete, where the main town hall complex of Oroville, it has got very large spans, but we have done several designs always to be able to keep calculating the engineering efficiency and arrive at very many a significantly reduced uh, volume of concrete spent for that many square meters uh, because we I, I do believe that instead of judging materials in black and white we should judiciously use high embodied energy materials for certain uses where long spans are involved and um, combined with ferro cement and uh, you know i think all materials um, should be spent with much more knowledge so you spend far less of them so these are some of the images uh, you will notice in these steps for example you see they are not just the usual cantilever shape the uh, it's a little bit of a hyperbolic paraboloid shape in the underside to make the 
it's it's a you can see the slight twist if you notice these are all engineering efficiencies to reduce the weight in cantilevers um and so one of the um, the pursuit of trying to save concrete um made me actually reach this um uh, the ferro cement research that i've been pursuing um ferro cement as you know is uh, just uh, allows the element to be only 2 and 1/2 cm or even sometimes only 12 mm thick because it uses very fine mesh distributed evenly instead of bigger reinforcement bars and i think the future in the future this material could play a very good role because it uses very little material but is very resilient and uh, i think it has seismic properties too i've also been experimenting with glass fiber and non corrosive materials like and on natural fibers we have not yet uh, arrived at some significant results but we are still exploring you know so so i've been looking at how we can build very very thin roofing elements i've uh, resorted to origami crease patterns so that um the material get gathers strength see the material is very thin so it, it by folding and bending is how you give it strength not by adding more and more steel that's what makes ferro cement different from concrete so i was looking at the realistic possibility since it's so lightweight to cast it on corrugated paper for refugees and earthquake um you know disaster relief etc you know that we are expecting in climate change you know tsunamis and all that so here you see that the scaffolding can be folded and folded also the mesh can be carried through this folding patterns and you know these are some of these are uh, prototypes that i am uh, developing for some of the projects so my experimental approach involves a lot of full scale prototyping this build this was built in one to two scale but it can also be used in one to one uh, we we made it for children actually as a pavilion but i'm i'm actually testing affordable housing alternatives here and it was built in 4 days just to give you an idea how fast it could go i'm also exploring ferro cement prefabricated elements kind of lego blocks which i want to uh, ergonomically design and finish with very nice cement oxides which we also have in our history the knowledge for and uh, to have all a lot of uh, very small houses that can be assembled for offices for buildings these can be put up in a week um, but they can be all prefabricated and carried by the human hand like four people can carry the biggest block and uh, uh, the, the, the sizes are also meant to take care of all um different things like kitchen counters and all all of that you know so i have recently managed to test these I've taken the Indian craftsmen from Tamil Nadu to the German lab and got all of this made and tested. I'm still continuing that some kind of research uh, with ferro cement. Here you see uh, one a module which of, of a toilet and shower cubicle with a wash basin in between them, which is not seen in this image. at the same time it harvests water there is a base plate which has a alternative sanitation that can be plugged in etc that the doors are not been put in they are also made in ferro cement so the, this can be assembled in a day so i'm also looking at uh, people's participation even in urban areas uh, to be able to uh, reduce you know the bank loans and you know to to not make technology so sophisticated that people cannot participate in the building of their house and reduce the costs if they want to so here is a, an example of an urban eco community um with rammed earth walls stabilized with 5% of cement for our climate there and not to demand too much of a maintenance with uh, streets on upper levels connecting different apartments a youth hostel in oroville many of you would have would been there would have probably even stayed there but then i have also been experimenting with uh, absorbing urban waste mostly with my students because uh, look i'm trying to um bring in the hands on experience you know the thinking with the hands opportunity when i'm teaching i want students to confront real materials in real scale with in real places and with uh, real people because i think in the end um, that's the real internship people need or at least during the studio we need to also understand 
uh, and not be only doing renderings and virtual projections of our what we think because we don't there are some things we if you don't embody the experience you don't really learn so i these are some of my student projects this is a tetra pack a recycle this is in mexico in a two day workshop we were teaching them how to set out curves how to build structurally stable walls like eladio dsta kind of forms um this is another project that i did where i you know old books are pulped and burnt and in uh, barcelona i had to do a pavilion and i thought why should i buy materials for four months so i took um old books which would have gone for pulping and i vacuum packed them in spain it's quite common to vacuum pack food items to increase their longevity i thought we should symbolically do that with the books and i made it's a household machine with which you can vacuum pack uh, so i force opened the books and i made canopies and i thought okay it's a four month event we don't buy anything we produce shade for people it was called library of lost books so people there are no books people are just remembering that you know the memory of of the books almost and it helps in these art or installations i try to provoke thought about the sustainability issues of our times you can see on the floor there are magazines folded into furniture as books um so here we have um, got uh, you know when i was asked to um, do the venice architecture biennale and i done the wall house in one to one i had taken some of the open questions by recycling bottles of you know in some other projects you'll see that i've done masonry with glass or i've used bicycle wheels for form work or in sept i did a workshop where you know all the denim rests which are not even waste coming out of denim factories creating pollution mountains of pollution have been used by my students to come up with structures um that are required i always bring craftsmen like artisans and uh, sewing machines i bring it all into the studio usually and uh, that's how students can make their tensile models so here you see the aa students are uh, building a round wood structure uh, uh, they're trying to build uh, high structures this, so this is a 10 day workshop for example uh, where we have they have designed and built a watch tower in the botanical garden and finally here is the ferro cement um, examples for students to discover forms or um, you know the a little more on the book sofas that i have uh, shown you earlier so just to localize the project and i will be ending with that this is uh, i didn't talk i showed the architectural material part but most of my projects were located in the oroville context especially my early work and i was also involved with the uh i had the great opportunity to collaborate with uh, roger anger the chief architect of oroville and um the urban part of oroville has not yet taken off and uh, we were he had designed a very alternative kind of pedestrian city which i really find it's a pity we have not yet uh, taken the urban step but what i also have done i'm not going to show you today but i've also involved in planning and uh, planning future cities uh, which are based on alternative mobility and rethinking infrastructure holistically uh, in the in the uh, and and that's what oroville is an opportunity for but in my um, ongoing exhibition in louisiana museum of modern art called taking time this project and all my work regarding planning has been showcased in a separate room and i will end with a few images showing a glimpse of what my exhibition looks like so there is a in louisiana so um the central object is my perspective on looking at the objects i've called it the architecture of time i've got a lot of collected objects where you can get to sense um and learn architecture that there is structure form order even before humans existed you know in our biology in in the way stones are formed and everything around us there's an exhibition on that and then there are material palettes of all my researches and in the background you see large photos of the context and projects and then there are 1 to 50 scale uh, models but also 1 to 1 and 1 to 2 scale details that i've shown there for people to experiment 
that from that central object, there's radiating all the different materials. The materials are chosen from the central object, which is a Wunderkama. And uh, there you understand architecture from a distance. And then you see. So through these one to five scale models, I have tried to demystify the construction aspect. Like concrete is cement is not just gray. It's, it's everything inside it. I've shown it to the general public. So you have spatial models. You see here the wall house drawings, model, people, but also one to five scale models of details. You see the background context, the kilns, the, you know, this is a glimpse for you because it's a chance for you to visit my exhibition virtually through this talk I'm holding. And this is the last image, which I would like to end with, is to say that um, if you go slow, that means if you take, there is no shortcut to learning. If you take the time that is needed to truly learn, to truly um, uh, absorb, uh, and not just take information as knowledge, but to, to take your integration in your being, that is knowledge. Uh, if you invest in knowledge, which is the under, this is the roots, uh, which you don't see, the trees are the result of that. And I wanted to, um, this is a sketch I gave uh, Alejandro Aravena when I gave the 2016 when I participated in the Biennale there, uh, I gave him the sketch because I said I didn't want to show the fruits, which are all those various projects, like the media covers them. But I wanted to sh explain architecture is the profession. It is the trunk of the tree. It integrates all from the roots. See the roots uh, investigate in unrelated directions, understanding about water, understanding about gender, understanding about uh, climate, whatever, all kind of methods, all kind of subjects. But the tree of the process of architects is to synthesize all of that. And the tree is the strength is in the trunk of the tree, which integrates. And every project, according to where it has to come, it's an expression of the knowledge, what is in the DNA flowing. So I would like to end with that and say that if you take your time, uh, not to delay, but like I said, proactively take hold of the time of your life, then you can uh, build knowledge and build buildings, uh, build knowledge and build community alongside building buildings. And um, with that thought, I would like to thank you and stop here. Anupama, thank you so much. I think what we can do is just for even a second, unmute your mics and give a big round of applause because that's the closest we'll come to an embodied experience. <laughs> Um, that, that was just brilliant. Um, um, I mean, there's just so much to, to always uh, look into your work and read about your work. May I just ask students to please mute your mics if you're not speaking, please, so that we can, we can hear each other better. Thanks. OK. Um, great. And so, you know, uh, Anupama, I mean, what, what you had uh, what we had spoken about sort of, you know, crowdsourcing questions from the students, which I've been able to. Students have put in questions and I've sort of grouped them um, in these domains of research, teaching, and, uh, and uh, design. Because, you know, those are the three worlds that you've, you've integrated and you continue to integrate um, in, in such meaningful ways, uh, both for yourselves, but also the kinds of contexts and uh, environments um, in which you, you operate. So, um, what I'll do is, as a discussant, I'll start with a few questions um, and also cite those who may have otherwise um, shared those questions or at least themes that were emerging from a number of questions from the students. And after a couple of, uh, let's say, three or four questions, I'll open it up to the audience as a way to then um, hopefully have those questions generate even more um, curiosities or thoughts on, on the work at hand. Um, so you know, one of the things that one one cannot help but notice is, um, um, you know, this this idea of research through making, and it's 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 such such a striking invisible aspect of your practice. 
this, um, that I'm wondering that if you could talk a little more about the coming together of um, the intuitive and the more systematized forms of uh, making projects, making buildings, um, in nurturing what you describe as this very process of building knowledge. So I'm wondering if you could start with that, you know, research through making and the coming together of the intuitive and the systematized in your work. Uh, yeah, I think that um, since we became a industrial, uh, you know, since industrialization happened, I don't think this was even in question. But nowadays people think that we do the thinking and then we give it to a machine to make it or we give it to the printer or we, you know, so we, we started treating our hands like as if it is separate from our head. I don't think some, there's not anything new in it, but like when you have a thought, like when you're writing, you just put a pen on a paper and you don't first think and then you formulate a sentence, then you write. So I think it happens because we are the same being. Uh, our brain is doing one job, the heart is doing one job, but they are in, they are all connected. Uh, I think uh, that is the, the where the intuitive happens, but that means it's not only that the intuition leads us to thoughts, but the thoughts lead us to the making of it as well. And in the making, like what I noticed is like when I learned knitting as a child, I realized that at a very young age, because it's just knitting, I'm repeating that thing, but I... Today, I can think of three-dimensional analogy. I, I could already because I did a lot of knitting, for example. So I knew if you increase a st st stitch or reduce, how do you get curves? How do you make domes? How do you, what really happens? So what, because this geometry of being flat, you know, or thinking that uh, geometry is a very fixed thing when you draw it on a paper, because you're drawing only one view of it because the paper is flat. It's not that the drawing is flat. In your head, the elevation plan and section is one drawing, only we are seeing it from different sides. So I think the making really helps you understand that, like suppose I give a three-year-old uh, child to take a square paper and fold it, they intuitively will fold it on the two ends and make a triangle. Most people will do it if you just give them a paper. And, and I mean, I don't. they don't have to know the name triangle, but they know that a, a square becomes two triangles. So doesn't just you all you take is take a hand and you fold and then you know these are called triangles and two triangle is equal to one square. So you see there's so much conductivity. So I think um, it's such a pity to not exploit this intelligence, the intelligent hand. And when I say the whole body, actually, when you move, even I learn dance and, you know, when you learn dance, you know that, you know, when you move your hand, this is an arc because this distance and my center, it will do this and I can do further curves. You know, this is in our body, the knowledge. Every dancer knows that geometry and they know space also. And uh, all of this is every day, every child every day is moving around space. You know, we are in the city, we have grown up. We've been in a space of the womb already before we are born. So we know about space, we know ourselves. We know we sometimes only, I think uh, we actually already know all that, but we have just got alienated uh, through the industrialization process perhaps. And we are looking too much for outer things. You know? And I think if we give these making experiences or when you research, you allow your hand and brain to connect again. That's the way I would put it. It's very simple. I think, um, see, like when you're cooking, you adjust recipes automatically. Or you see something is burning. You have a recipe. You know the oven should do that many minutes. And you say, oh, no, the crust. Are you going to sit and say, no, I'm not going to touch it. It's burning. I don't know why. But I just know that, oh, maybe I put a too big a pot and maybe the cake is too thin, too low. So th therefore, it's burning a few minutes earlier. I have to put it off. So these are little knowledges. If you make that cake, you know. But if I only read manuals, I will never know that, that what is to be standardized and what is variable. So the intelligence, the information remains as a cold information. And I think the potential when you actually, when we make models in a different scale, we learn a lot of things. But if you embody that and do it in your scale, you learn a whole lot of things very quickly, I think. 
so I, I I like to do that because I have experienced how much I learned by those methods. Yeah, and you know, it's it's yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, I think uh, what you're talking about this this kind of uh, embodied knowledge, right? And then and one really thinks of of the knowledge as embodied. And, and kind of practiced in the world through our body. Um, what's interesting to me is also when I heard you say, particularly in this talk, this notion of a liberated time. And, and, and you kind of walked us through ways in which uh, that's not just a notion, but, but, but it's really, uh, you know, the way you've been able to immerse yourself in, not, in thinking about the spatial qualities uh, that make up a built environment, uh, the movement, the travels that you've done, uh, the kinds of, uh, um, projects that you've been uh, involved with and led that, that has allowed you to build both uh, yourself but also build knowledge in relation to the people that you have actually come together. So one of the questions from the students um, is uh, that, you know, it's, 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 it's very interesting as an idea to kind of slow down the time and, and to really immerse oneself in the place or the, the very um, um, sort of the, the requirements of, of, of maintaining focus and maintaining understanding of a question and who it matters. But for students in this, in this current distracted age of the internet, um, where, where there's information that's galore, um, and the idea of place also feels a little too distracted than, than something which is much more kind of uh, identified with a geographical location, how, uh, what advice would you have? How do you sort of, how do you engage with your own students when they are kind of both part of a kind of a larger networked public, but also through the kind of very careful making processes that you engage them. You're asking them to connect with the people in a place. I always, um, uh, I mean, because I uh, perhaps I, I live that myself, I always feel, I never feel like I'm from this place or that place, you know. Uh, I've never felt like that. I feel like all the homo sapiens are wherever they are born. And, you know, I mean, I think that it's a bit overrated. I mean, the cultural part is absolutely true. But the universal part, which is common to all of us, is way more common than it is uh, seen as. And I feel, therefore, um, see, whatever knowledge is created, like when the Romans discovered to do those arches, the whole world is applying them or anyone, you know, I think we collectively are part of a uh, evolution and I like to remain aware of that, but it doesn't help me to think like, okay, I can be informed what is happening in the US politics, okay, but it helps me more if I'm, I'm reading about it, but in my own way, I'm more present in my immediate family. I'm available in my uh, school. I'm like, whatever problems came up there, I want to improve that, you know, like now, um, I mean, I think as the architects, I always encourage students to think from what is your problem, what problem can you identify? Not like what's your problem in the sense that uh, not to encourage complaining and whining, but to say that, look, we always notice because if you have a designer mind, we always think it ought to be better or this could have functioned better. We keep on looking around us and say, oh, this door doesn't close properly or whatever it is. Then ask ourselves, what can we do to do it? And then do it, you know, fix it. Or you imagine that it would be so good to have a certain kind of uh, table. Or when I was in studying, I want felt like as an architect, I need to have all my things sorted out, all these pens here, my pencils there. Then just imagine it and do it, and you make it. Don't wait for the carpenter. You make it with cardboard. Do it with whatever. Just keep doing around you what you can. And I think if we create this, see every every school can be better if we just wait for the administration to provide everything. And, uh, you know, then what is the use? I mean, then you you act like a victim of circumstance instead of acting like empowered beings. And no one asked us not to do that. In any institution I've gone till now, there's no nothing that says, no, you can't do that. You, you are free to, who told, we don't have to do the bare minimum that education asks us to do. Just like the bylaws, they ask us to do the bare minimum. That doesn't mean that we are happy with that. Why should we? We can, and we, we think it's going to be a lot of work, a lot of money. If you actually think it through, it's all doable. Because believe me, when I started my 
own life as you have seen with the hut i wasn't getting supported by my family or anything i have been the same young person in school college how did i meet lori baker i went to meet him there was a conference and i wanted to meet him so i decided to go it, it that time he was not even that known as we now know but if you feel like doing something i i am not going to complain to my school and say why is smart architecture not being taught in my school many people were doing that i was just saying okay whatever my parents give me whatever my country is whatever our situation i've grown up in the main thing is i am alive so i am living and i can because i'm alive so i can decide what i'm doing with my time i'm going to go i like mad architecture okay i don't know about it okay who knows about it where are they go there you know and there were other friends like that uh, i you know among fr friends you can you know organize this and you can always compliment what you're getting from an institute or you know the, you, your parents may be able to support a certain education maybe they cannot uh, so they can't do better everyone is giving you what they can what you can do better is you do the rest you know and then you have it and then you just feel very empowered and you to do the next thing you would feel even easier and easier so i think i think education should be taken what i would tell the youth i would say education should be taken in your own hands see nobody by going to harvard or some famous schools doesn't mean you will come out with that you know you will be as passive there or here or as active and uh, what you absorb is from your hunger so you have to only find like if you the same air is around us you can choose to take a deep breath or a shallow breath it's up to you you have to do the living part of it that's what i would say great um anupama this this question comes from the batch of 2018 and akila who is one of the students of current s5 um and her question is that we visited the wall house last year and it was a really great um, case study looking back at the pictures from when it was just built and from when we visited it last year well, one could notice differences uh, with the roofing with the openings with the flooring um so akila's question is looking back today do you, what, what would you would you have done something differently if you could and what were some of the major design decisions that were taken during its construction the the um if i look back would i do some things differently um well i i would do something differently i have um, i had wanted to test um i did two load bearing brick structures and in between i did a column frame vault which i wanted to separately test and i have left a certain gap i have placed the staircase in a, in a kind of on the axis of one of the walls and i know that certain problems come which i later faced uh, could have been solved if i had made that wider i had i would have put the staircase in the full gap and i would be much more flexible there are, this this is the only thing i think but in all other things i feel uh, um i never expected it to be like a static house and, and as you will see there were three different phases early i lived the first i lived in it without any doors and windows um because i was eager to move in and i couldn't afford the doors and windows yet so and i thought that anyway anybody could get into my hut as well so why should i wait i started living when i was ready it was 2000 that year and i said i have to do something i moved to that house you know i was taking too long to build it um based on my funds and um then um i kept on adapting i made this room into that room i tried this and that then at one point my mother was paralyzed and she lived with me so i completely revamped everything and made that lower brick room for my mother's and my for my parents whom i was taking care of her had to maneuver the wheelchair the house was quite open that way i could uh, manage and then there was a second phase then i had children i modified another room into their room i added some ferro cement loft beds and keeping the imprint small and now again i am i don't live there much so it other people don't have my sense of openness of living openly so i had to enclose so i see the house as much as a living being as i see myself so it i, I it will change further also 
and it's all good it's the same way i look at a lot of my other decisions i made in my life that's that's the best i knew that's the thing i decided and it's fine because that that experience shaped me and whatever i learned i don't have any regrets in general in life whatever i learned i will apply to my next situation it's a constant expansion of knowledge and experience which is another way for 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 i mean to sort of even understand this idea of liberated time right so as opposed to thinking of time as a, as a constraint or something which is determined through through the clock time one is able to sort of live and really make and, and remake architecture yes uh, i would like to add, yeah. when you see yeah, that yeah, every many people feel that see if i would have known that it will take me 10 years to solve some basic you know understanding i would think oh it's such a 10 year project i won't even embark so today i'll keep on doing the everyday habit so what happens is people make a big procrastinations based on that because they think that it will take that much time to know a thing so you know so for example you want to have organic food let's say or and you think it's unachievable or some little thing if you have to plant it's going to take so long for it to happen so you think that often people know see i have always asked myself that early i used to think people don't know how to do it better but i came to the conclusion quite early on that people know very well what they don't like doing but they still do it like you don't like that you're getting up late in the morning whatever it is you don't you want to go to the gym and every day you're not going or whatever it is you want to do whatever it is that you're procrastinating it has it all comes down to that mini 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 moment of now which action you took or you didn't take so everyone thinks of the future as a grand thing but it's the mini moment that's the only moment you're alive so what you did or didn't do will it affect your big future i did not do all this so that 30 years later i will get rewarded you know i in that moment it was i have to overcome my laziness i have to overcome uh, my ignorance i have to i know that i want to do this and that if i want to do this and that and i'm not doing in my today's moment the step that i would have to do to build this muscle or to build this thing if i it's inconvenient i have to come out of my comfort zone right and that's why we are not doing it so i realize that if i don't do it in that many moments there are many days i have not taken those decision and that's why i don't like to whine and complain because i could have done it and i know what i did and what i didn't do and that i very well know that this i am responsible for the future i'm going to have so we have to be to be awake and to inhabit your time that's what i mean you know it's the many many moments each minute of your life you think oh, nothing big is happening today i don't need to change anything but it is happening because what you did today will be what you will predict every minute is a crossroad your your 30 years will look like in that scenario or that scenario every minute and even if you went there you can still go there you know but every minute is making it shaped and everything you procrastinate will make it easier for you to procrastinate tomorrow because you the resistance will be bigger tomorrow if you did give in so i've been battling those issues um and one one question i have and then we'll open it up uh, for questions from the from the students and faculty as well um mm -hmm. is this uh, is this question of uh, teaching so we've we've you know we've looked at your projects you know the the very embedded ways in which you design and you've also walked us through your teaching and and vidya who is currently in her third semester um has this question for you is to one how do you engage students in your teaching which we got a glimpse of and an understanding about as well but then what do you learn from your students and how have you been able to integrate those learnings back into your architectural practice so i don't try to what it was the thing how do you include your, what was it that formulation of the students how do you engage so it, uh, one how do you engage students yeah, yeah so to, you see i don't how, try to engage okay, like, my, yeah. i do the same to my own children also see i don't try to motivate my students and all those thing because you know i realize no matter what you do you can't actually motivate somebody else you know actually i believe this okay uh, maybe it's not so nice for a teacher to say that but i think that you know there used to be a time when people were dying to learn you know and then they were not getting the teachers you know we learned when i learned classical dance we really learn all this in our culture very well we don't pay we don't think oh i have paid them so i am automatically getting the knowledge you know what we pay is nothing 
what he's giving me is priceless you know the attentiveness to my development so i i don't think i have to motivate you know i just don't like to uh i think i wait that they are motivated <laughs> i whoever is motivated if you're motivated if you are not motivated what can i do i can only try to not uh, make your life more miserable by making you do things which you are totally not relating to you know and if if somebody is so full you can't give them more food you know if the hunger has not there what can i do you know i can wait till your hunger comes you know i'm i'm there you know so i try to i don't try to engage people i don't make effort there but i i hope that the way i live and the way i take my own teaching or my work seriously i hope that it rubs off to them because it can happen that you get stimulated i get very enthused when i'm with other people who love their job and their things so i also like that kind of company and i hope that it does affect them um and many and in the same way their enthusiasm affects me so when i see a student is really really aspiring to do something um you know a problem which they are not when i see they are not giving up even they are not uh, you know getting it but they are still finding out researching building this model doing when i see that i'm they inspire me too because in the end i don't feel like who is inspiring whom i think i believe in that collective uh, you know sort of vibration of mood you create you know of investigation and all that so i don't have this feeling of superiority or inferiority or anything i feel that like with when you meet any other person and i'm also that way social even though i'm also introverted i mean um i when i meet anyone i'm interested if i meet a child i meet a elderly person i'm interested in their thoughts and um and i think you always take something back because uh because you, if you're open you 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 know i mean it's stimulating i think and and mostly if i'm inspired by the students it is just that because they are young and i get to know that their pulse i get to know their world their generation that's what i take back it makes me expanded just like with my own children you know they they have their comments to things and i don't ex i'm not expecting validation or guru worship or anything of that sort i'm very happy when because their questions could have been my own it's not like i'm so clear i also have questions you know so i also share them with them where i still have questions on that uh, on that note of questions let's let's hear from from uh, from others in the room i hope the discussion gave us some time to process the talk and organize our thoughts and questions uh we will now move to the audience for any questions you may have for dr kundu please use the raise hand option so we can go in that order also there's the option of putting down your questions in the chat box the platform is open to both faculty and students yes rushab please go ahead hello ma'am uh uh in the starting of this uh, talk you talked about using local materials and incorporating them in your buildings and, and if you can give us an example or a learning which you found in arovel or in any other place a very different form of local material which you, which was completely new to you and also helped you change your understanding of design in a way uh i would um, mention lorry baker especially to you all in kerala you know we needed a lorry baker to make us appreciate our own bricks and to be able to use it with intelligence with um, the, it's the design looks so invisible in the way it it belongs to the local context but everything is that is the way it's put together is rethought and it is rethought with the intention of optimizing of saving the number of bricks for bringing more beauty for, for uh, making it accessible to everybody regardless of budget and using engineering to optimize steel but also using sensitivity you know working with the human scale working with this um jali patterns and and uh, yeah i think he's the best example of that 
because it, it is a local material. It's like if I take local ingredients and otherwise I can tell more examples from food. Uh, you know, I know many, many people who cook exquisite um, contemporary foods out of absolutely local products. And it, you can produce always something new because we as humans, we are infinite in our, you don't have to think that, oh, Laurie Baker has only already solved this roof. So what can I do now? Okay, that's the way he, you don't have to purposely, I don't believe that innovation has to be there for its own sake. Okay, like Charles and Ray Eames said, uh, I really believe that <clears throat> things which are already working, they don't need to be tweaked at all. I'm quite happy with the very classic stuff, you know, but there are, the point is that every at every moment as we evolve as humans and as the human also evolves, we keep needing different things and those we keep manifesting problematics of the, as a society uh, grows and evolves and we have to uh, steer our way in a lot of social transitions and all that. So there are always so many areas where uh, uh, design could make uh, something uh, can really significantly contribute and so i don't think that we have to purposely look for innovation for its own sake but there are if you genuinely identify things that can be much better for our use as humans and uh, then there are endless places to contribute and laurie baker is yeah a very good example even he came from his english roots and we are unable to reinvent the brick because we are caught with the Mackay British system. But he wasn't, he produced an architecture which people identify with Kerala worldwide. Thank you, ma'am. And with the Kerala tile also. Thank you, Rusha. We can probably take one more question. Very nice question. Yes, Anis, please go ahead. Hi, ma'am. Uh, my name is Anis and I'm a third year student at Lebanon. So we actually had the honor of actually visiting some of your projects in uh, Pondicherry and at Oroville. So that was a nice experience being there. The questions that I had actually twofold. One uh, is I wanted to get your opinion about, uh, we've talked about your, we've heard your talks about how um, you practice a, a little bit more vernacular architecture, trying to revive the social aspects of architecture itself, connecting a lot more about the people itself. Uh, the question that I had was, what is your opinion regarding uh, the massive increase in population? And at the same time, we have very li limited amount of land resources that are left to build upon. So how do we tackle the same issue uh, in terms of the reduced amount of land that's available for building while the population is increasing? So how would you suggest tackling that while still maintaining a, uh, a lesser footprint, a carbon footprint, on the rest of the land. That was the first question. The second question is actually a little bit more let of a... Just answer that because I'll not remember. I already forgot the very first one. So let me sure. answer this and then we'll do that, okay? You mentioned that I'm trying to do vernacular architecture, whatever, but that is not really true. Just to clarify, I know what you mean also. But it's not, you know, because I vernacular is a thing which used to go on in a settlement as it was. A lot of people confuse local materials with vernacular architecture and that is not really the right definition if you look at banister fletcher's vernacular architecture so we look at a mud wall or even if you if i would color uh, some mud plaster on some concrete thing it will be called vernacular that is wrong you know so because there's a lot of design involved in vernacular you do it because that's how you do it you know like uh, a vernacular you know so this is highly designed stuff okay uh, in order to be able to support the tiles without the, the the wood structure and you're creating all that this is nothing vernacular it's not something you went to a place and saw like it's just as as much as the fancy chefs who are producing local organic product it cannot be called a vernacular meal if i'm in spain and i'm producing with spanish ingredients it can be anything what i produce okay so i just want to make a minor correction there because uh it, it is definitely not vernacular, the work that I'm doing, but I am advocating for, if I'm advocating, neither is the type of spaces you see in my architecture, anything close to vernacular, not that I don't like vernacular, it's just that I'm a very, myself, 
no, a non-nostalgia driven person. I'm just like that. I'm only excited about the future. Past is over. I That doesn't mean I'm going to be silly about, uh, uh, you know, for me, this is a quality of space I kept on saying, which is contemporary and I can hold it with whatever is there. Just like I can take those ingredients and make whatever food I want to eat and enjoy my fragrances and flavors, you know. So that flavor is contemporary. The ingredient is local, okay. Uh, you spoke about population. Uh, I want to say that I, because India's population is way more than uh, whatever way we are building um, our current cities, uh, it wouldn't. That's why we have social segregation in India, and I definitely think that is the biggest challenge for India. India can't afford to get its urbanization wrong, but we keep on out of our inferiority complex, I guess, we keep on um, taking solutions that other people have done in the world and we apply it even though they have much less less people in their planet, first, I mean, their country, first of all. So, and there are many other issues that they have solved, which we haven't, or less, such as very basics, like equality uh, and uh, for uh, of, on gender and on all the levels, we have, we are very far from all that, okay? So without having all that, we don't even have electricity for everyone. We, we want to go digital. So we have too many gaps there. So that uh, that apart, I think um, for India, but also for the rest of the world, the future of cities will, uh, a lot of the infrastructure you see uh, where India is producing apartments, towers, without having infrastructure placed beforehand. All these places we copy from, they have already put the infrastructure first, then they build the plots and then they build the city. So we are building the architecture and the planning has to be done retroactively by whoever, because the ownership model and the developer model is the driving force. Our cities do not have architecture that the city creates and gives to and on rent. So there's a lot of complex issues you have raised here from governance to everything else. So, but if I talk only about the physical aspects, I think that the the key challenge which I've been working on, I don't have full answers, but um, what I showed you, my last project, um, based on Roger Angers' master plan, it was already conceived 50 years ago as a model city approach. So, um, in order to reduce the heavy infrastructure we see everywhere between Bombay, Pune, and everything, even within Bombay and Delhi is that the, the pedestrian mobility has to become the new determinant for all over worldwide. And if the car doesn't have to reach every, because few people will have car, very small percentage, and most of the people in India still walk. If you look at the London School of Economic Studies, they, the walk and bicycle is still the bulk of the population, and we, have, we design nothing for the bicycle. So we have to reverse this, and that will lead to um, uh, much more smaller compact cities, and cars and vehicles will have to be kept every aside so that the pedestrian will, will require narrower spaces. So there will be huge land economy. If you look at how those highways and roads and parkings cost, it's a lot. And India should, like Japan, because they have similar problem, they should uh, make people who, uh, like, you cannot just park a car anywhere. You have to, you want to own a privilege of having a car in Tokyo. You decide whether you want to build one room less and make it into a parking or not. So here we do opposite FSI free because we think we will boost the economy by selling cars. And uh, so few people have the car and all the other people have the traffic. Even especially for bullock carts, they have to go uphill on flyovers. It's a disaster. So the new mobility will create uh, those kind of cities. Now, I do think it has to go high rise. And that's the challenge. And I, it, it, there won't be time to explain that here. But you can look it up in Google. And I have shown a huge room uh, where building upon Roger Angers' urbanism plans for exactly what you, your question was. Um, there's a project called Line of Goodwill that I've been working on, which, uh, which has a pedestrian mobility on high rise. But they are horizontal towers and not vertical ones. They are very sloped. You can walk on the roof, see all the buildings. In apartments, all the roofs are wasted. All so I I want the roads to be up there, you know. So it will, yeah. It's a complex question, but yeah, I am working exactly on this. You had a second part of the question. 
Yes, ma'am. The, they are, aren't actually related, but the second part of the question is more about um, uh, architectural pedagogy. And um, I've come upon the uh, works of Nari Oxman, the Israeli architect. Uh, she researches a lot more. She works with the MIT uh, Design Lab, and then her works are more uh, about research of material itself. But the kind of material that she looks into are a bit more of a living uh, materials, organisms, and how that comes into play in architecture and things like that. So what is your opinion on that sort of a research? I don't know. I have never heard about her work. So you can ask me what exactly you mean, uh, because I, I really don't know what the reference you're talking about. Uh, so basically, she's an Israeli architect. She's working with the MIT Met Lab, uh, Design Lab. So what the work, the design uh, research, what she's actually doing is, uh, like you mentioned earlier in your talks, it's a multidisciplinary design lab wherein there are uh, microbiologists, there are engineers, there are architects, and all of them come together to produce design and material research that are not just limited to um, the non-living organisms, or non-living things like uh, earth or clay or baking. It's actually also about organisms and how they can actually be a part of architecture. For example, the mycelium bacteria, they actually yeah, use yeah. The bacteria to build uh, yes, structures. So what is yeah. your opinion on research on that line? Oh, I don't have any opinion. Everyone should research whatever they want. I literally don't have any opinion, sorry. But I have a lot of students working on mycelium and all of those things. But I can just say something related to what you said. And you, if those who follow me on Instagram will see that I'm detailed reporting on that. I'm calling it the architecture of time. And I've explained how time is the architect, actually, the passage of time you know, has formed uh, caves, stalactites, uh, bubbles, uh, stones shaped by sedimentary rocks. So it's just a passage of time that creates space, uh, the, the order in which space and matter come together and reveal the invisible forces or laws of the universe. And I am encouraging people in that Punda Kama that I've put up in the exhibition to understand uh, architecture, before uh, architects and before humans even. So th there are three categories in that. That's called architecture of, um, I've called it act architecture of matter. According to evolution, there was first matter. But even in that, there was architecture. Then there is architecture of life, where small organisms came. Even the mushroom, you're talking mycelium. You can see why does a mushroom curve? Why does a shell? What is in the DNA that makes already the, the geometry of a tree it it goes it's not like a geometry static it is it it is a radial geometry for some part of its life and then it becomes some other thing and throughout like a seed becomes a tree it has flowers the fruit is something else um so what uh, how is the dna inside life that the that the architecture is in the cell and how it en unfolds over time and uh, to study order, there's almost uh, no question that time has not already solved in terms of space order, in my opinion. And I've, I've not, uh, again, I said this is not an opinion, it's a gathering of objects that I've archived over there. So the second section is the architecture of life. So architecture of matter, architecture of life, and then I've added architecture of mind. Because I think the human mind is going through its dilemma. Uh, of not being a perfect instrument, but we have our biology, we are in the life category, but we also in life at some point my mind sprouted and it's not perfect, but the mind has created constructs which in fact create other architectures like whether like I said, whether you knit or weave or make a brick mold because you made a brick mold suddenly all your walls can be made different so they affect architecture you know so the the, the tools you make like it's like the homo faber you make the, the tools and the tools make you and like that's how humans because they were not using their two hands when they learned to walk they to they learned to walk to look above the grasses to protect themselves as a weak species so they look and because the hands became redundant, they didn't know how to take the weight. So they start to use the hand and develop skills. And then they've developed tools and they became more and more powerful. This Anthropocene age where we are commanding so much of the earth. You know, I am interested in uh, biology and anthropology because in order to design habitat for the 
humans you have to first of all know what humans need like yan gale said we know our biologists know what the what habitat does a dolphin need what habitat does antelope need what habitat does anything need but they don't know what habitat do humans need uh, no one's seeing that part we take it for granted so there is so i'm interested for that reason in biology because what is human and how are the human evolving and also anthropology which which gives us a very these are the new two things i'm studying and i think uh, in the general uh, i don't know what about that lab so i don't want to comment but i think interdisciplinary is normal and uh, to do i mean it uh, it's i think we should never exist in isolation you know because uh, then the knowledge it becomes too insular that's all i can say to that but you can uh, visit if some of you have instagram you can uh, because i don't have an opportunity to tell all those things that i do so i because of my exhibition i'd made an effort because there was too much material written by others and nothing coming from me so i thought okay it's a huge effort in the covid times four years of preparing an exhibition so i decided to take a few minutes from time to time and explain little little bits in very small bites that you can chew <laughs> So I'm it, I'm doing that record mostly for myself to go to one spot and have the pictures and have some comments. So maybe there you'll find out more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anise. Thank um, you for all these questions. Did Wafa have a question? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm Wafa from the first year. Ma'am, I was fascinated by how you used the Tetra Packs uh, for the installation. So uh, the, this is a question that came up into mind. Uh, how can we reduce plastic waste? Because uh, there are tons and billions of plastic waste that's being generated every year. And how can we use them into architecture? Actually, I don't want to use them because, you know, we are giving a false message as if uh, people should keep on doing plastic and we will magically come and absorb them. So regarding plastic, I don't, in general, I don't want to do that. I have used Tetra Pak because it's the hardest material. Again, I have not done it to, to uh, uh, pretend that I can solve the uh, anything for the Tetra Pak. You know, Tetra Pak is got four separate materials. It's very hard to recycle. It's got aluminum, it's got plastic, it's got paper, it's got, lots and it's a very sophisticated product that is made to be waterproof um so i thought you see when i do these workshops when people don't have a budget and they want to work with the real material i tell them to take an unconventional material like a book or whatever you have i'm not doing it because i want to uh, promote uh, promote the f message to the in uh, industry that you produce any junk i'm here i'll come and fix it no i don't want to do that but i I do want my students to get sometimes for play an unconventional material which they can discover and do something with it because I believe that when they go back they will realize that even the brick I can look at new because I just learned how to look at it new at the same time I made a structure so if I use those material it's only for that and also because then it doesn't cost anyone anything this is something you readily find and we can have fun and do something for two days where there's a lot of learning. So my uh, focus is on what can I learn from that least Tetra Pak issue and what can each student learn. And uh, so what we had done in that case is we had filled, we realized it's such a waterproof, fantastic material. Why crush it? All those who recycle Tetra Pak, they crush it and they use uh, more chemicals and stick it into boards. I really question all that. I think, oh God, why should you make even more chemicals spent? So, and in the end, you don't even know it's Tetra Pak. It just looks like a funny, uh, ugly, untidy board, which is very costly and uh, problematic. And I, I, I don't believe in this kind of recycling also. So I just do it. I'm not aiming to be doing a big recycling job there. I, I'm telling people, look, this is all we found to do a hands-on workshop. I tell them, find anything which is in your area. It doesn't matter because the learning will be same if you do any plastic bottle, glass bottle, brick. I think the learning, all the universal laws are same. Gravity is same. Everything is same. So it doesn't matter. When you learn about a circle, you learn about spiral. You learn same geometry. You know, in everything, you learn the same thing. So it doesn't matter what the material is. In that spirit, I've taken it. And 
I would like to just tell you that, um, yeah, because if they have spent so many resources to make a waterproof thing, why not keep it waterproof and use that quality and enhance that quality? That's the only thing I like about that object. So <laughs> we try to fill water into it or sand or whatever and make it like a brick and just use it as a brick because it's a brick you don't have to buy. That's what we did. And regarding plastic bottles, I think you said, what can we do to stop the plastic bottle? You said the answer, just stop making the bottle. Don't make a bottle and then we don't need plastic bottle. You know what you can do? Why do we have plastic bottle to sell water to people? What did we have earlier? We had everywhere a fire hydrant and a water pipe in every village in your area. You have a place where you can fill your bottle in a tap. Some places in Australia, they've done it all over the campus. You just have a clean filter. You have your own bottle. I have my bottle. I go there, I fill the water wherever and go. And there are times you want to buy it. Okay, like in an airplane for some other law, they are not letting us take our water bottle. Okay, they are serving us. Okay, fine. Let's not be religious and fanatic about it. But that doesn't mean everyone has to buy a bottle all the time as the only way to um, breathe. Suppose I tell you the air that you breathe, oxygen, will be bottled. It will look ridiculous. When our generation was seeing water bottles, we used to find it ridiculous. Now it looks normal. So what do we have to do with that? It's just when you want to stop something, just don't don't start it or make those people pay the real cost of recycling and fixing it then the, it will become so expensive that nobody will have it and they'll realize it's much better to put clean water points all over the city so cheap Ma'am, I just wanted to inquire about the existing plastic waste that's been uh, deposited onto the oceans and uh, the beach side. Yeah. Because people are coming with innovative ideas. Yeah. So I just wanted great. to know how it could be taken into architecture. You just look at all those ideas. Lots of people are doing things with all that, you know. Uh, so everyone has to do like, it doesn't have to be through me, you know, I mean, uh, in the sense that um, I'm working on the causes that I feel motivated towards and uh, I think you yourself can start. You will know because you are thinking about this a lot. So surely you have an idea. If you, instead of looking elsewhere, browsing mm -hmm. solutions, if you just think, make some drawings, what would you do with all these bottles? I'm sure you will be able to offer us a solution. Definitely, ma'am. Definitely. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you okay. for the question. In the interest of time, we'll have to take a pause here now. Thank you so much, Dr. Anupama Kuntu, for your stimulating talk. We are so honored and grateful for your presence and for sharing your work, thoughts, and experiences you. with us. Your enthusiasm and lifestyle is so inspiring. Uh, it was all the more interesting for 2018 batch and me because we were fortunate enough to visit the wall house and town hall with architect Poonam uh, last year. Oh, I see. On, yeah, on behalf of uh, Avani community, I thank you for making this evening so memorable. You've left us uh, very optimistic and we look forward to seeing you on campus in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to tell you all that, listen, uh, if I can do something and it, instead of looking up to me, you just think that if I can do, you can also do, you know, and you can do more because you're younger. You have more time. Okay. So. Thanks. Thank, thank you. All. Let's, uh, let's just give a big round of applause to Anupama. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining us from Berlin. Have, have a good one. Take care. You'll be in touch. Yeah. Thank you. Stay in touch. Bye. Bye, ma'am. Thank you, 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 ma'am. Thank you,
it's an honor thank you ma'am ma my pleasure thank you ma'am bye